During the final days of 1944, U.S. Admiral William Halsey and his 30,000-man 3rd Fleet were refueling their vessels after a three-day operation when they were notified of poor weather conditions. Believing the climate would improve, Halsey unwittingly drove his ships into the eye of a massive storm. For two days, Task Force 38 was shaken by winds of up to 140 miles per hour and monstrous 70-foot tall waves. There was no way out at that point, and Halsey and his team soon realized this was no ordinary storm. It was a typhoon. Task Force 38. The U.S. Navy formed the 3rd Fleet on March 15, 1943. The fleet was commanded by William Halsey, Jr., who had gained notoriety in the Pacific Theater due to his aggressive and risk-taking nature. The primary element of the 3rd Fleet was the massive assembly of warships in Carrier Task Force 38, which consisted of three eight-mile diameter circles of vessels in formation. In total, Task Force 38 had 17 carriers, six battleships, 13 cruisers, 58 destroyers, and over 1,100 aircraft. In October of 1944, Task Force 38, led by Vice Admiral John S. McCain Sr., fought in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. It was the largest naval battle of the war, and frequently considered the largest naval battle in history. Over 200,000 Navy personnel were involved in the conflict that lasted from October 23rd to 26th. American and Australian forces battled the dwindling Imperial Japanese Navy, intending to isolate them from the countries they had previously occupied in Southeast Asia, all of which were a vital source of oil for the Axis powers. By the fall of 1944, the Imperial Japanese Navy had fewer capital ships than the Allied forces in the area. Still, they put up an impressive fight by mobilizing all their remaining major vessels in an attempt to withstand the American and Australian invasion. However, the Battle of Leyte Gulf was a resounding Allied victory. All Japanese efforts were repulsed by Halsey's 3rd Fleet and the Navy's 7th Fleet, commanded by William R. Murs. A short vacation. After the victorious battle, Task Force 38 was granted a 10-day resting period in late November at the Caroline Islands base of Uliti Atoll. The Navy had built a recreation center on the tiny island of Mogmog, where the men swam, played baseball and basketball, pitched horseshoes, and swigged soft drinks and beer. Meanwhile, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest J. King was angry at Admiral Halsey for leaving the San Bernardino Strait unguarded. He told Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, the commander of the entire Pacific Fleet, that they needed to put Halsey on break. As Supreme Commander of the Southwest Pacific Area, General Douglas A. MacArthur obliged and asked for Halsey's relief. The Admiral had been spending time visiting his wounded sailors, joking and shaking hands with them. During one of the final nights of the resting break, he also attended a party hosted by hospital ship nurses, where they all partied before returning to open waters. Despite the suspension, Halsey and Task Force 38 were back on the Philippines coastline, dodging Japanese kamikazes by Thanksgiving Day. But as luck would have it, three of the force's carriers were damaged as one of Halsey's top men erroneously dismissed the suicide attackers. The Admiral's fortunes would continue to worsen by December, but Mother Nature would be to blame this time. Back in action. On December 11, 1944, the 90 ships that comprised Task Force 38 left Uliti. Vice Admiral McCain was aboard USS Hancock, while Admiral Halsey was in his flagship, a 45,000-ton New Jersey battleship. The group planned to hit the Philippine island of Luzon to support General MacArthur's invasion of Mindoro. They would then travel deep into the South China Sea to sever Japan's last remaining shipping lines serving the East Indies. On December 13th, the carriers headed towards the Luzon coast. Fight sweeps immediately began upon arrival and continued for three more days. By the time the American flat tops withdrew from the area on December 16th, their dive bombers and fighters had destroyed 269 Japanese aircraft, sunk several merchant ships, and blasted airfields and railroads. Only 27 American planes were lost. Playing the odds. On December 17th, the task force was set to join the 3rd Fleet's refueling group and launch another three-day fighter strike two days later. The vessels were low on fuel coming from three days of fighting, and they rendezvoused with fleet oilers, fleet tugs, destroyers, destroyer escorts, and escort carriers with replacement planes 500 miles east of Luzon. The 3rd Flight's aerologist then received a report from Pearl Harbor that a weak tropical storm was coming. But another conflicting Pearl Harbor weather report predicted that the storm would move north, which would clear Task Force 38 by about 200 miles. Even Halsey's own staff predicted that they would miss the storm. Weather technology in the 1940s had little to no capability of tracking upcoming typhoons, 
and avoiding these storms depended mainly on the seaman's weather eye and constant and shrewd watchfulness. Halsey then decided to stay put and ordered the ships to hold the formation for another day, but after beginning the refueling process on schedule, a 20 to 30 knot wind hit the ships, which yawed and surged until it became too dangerous to continue. Eye of the Storm Forecasters from the Third Fleet repeatedly misdiagnosed the situation, as weather reports had a delay of 12 hours. As the morning went on, the refueling became increasingly dangerous, and several near collisions forced Halsey to order a delay at 12.51 p.m. The Admiral also ordered vessels that had not been wholly refueled to ballast down with salt water. However, many of the ships disobeyed, hoping they would be able to refuel as soon as the weather calmed down. Vice Admiral John McCain followed Halsey's order, except on the Spence, Hickox, and Maddox destroyers. They were at 10% fuel and would not make it another 24 hours. Spence and Hickox thus remained with the oiler vessels to refill when the seas allowed. As Halsey attempted to maneuver the fleet into a calm area where they could refuel, he inadvertently placed part of the fleet directly into the storm's path. By the end of the day, the fleet was moving in the same direction as the storm, but ahead of it and a bit faster. This misled the staff into believing that weather conditions were improving. However, by 4 a.m., the third fleet finally realized they were in real trouble. The storm continued to grow, and hours later, even the barometer on Halsey's ship started to fail. Their worst fear was coming true. They were approaching a typhoon. Damage The typhoon's worst damage happened between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. It tossed all the ships in the formation in 70-foot waves as the wind roared at 83 knots, with gusts well over 100 knots. Halsey didn't give the vessels approval to break out on their own, which turned out to be his biggest mistake. Still, some commanding officers feared for their lives and turned away on their own initiative. The ships that remained in formation took the worst beating. The winds reached hurricane strength during the afternoon, and several of the carriers at the front got so close that they were able to see the eye of the storm on their radars. Some ships even passed right through it. At 1.45 p.m., Halsey finally issued a typhoon warning to the Third Fleet's weather central. By the time the storm cleared the next day, the entire Third Fleet was scattered around. Many of the ships suffered battle-level damage. Three destroyers sunk, and 150 aircraft were destroyed due to fire, impact damage, or being swept off the carriers. Almost 800 seamen were lost at sea. During the next few days, rescue operations searched the area, and they were able to save 93 soldiers from the sea or wreckage. The teams withdrew back to Uliti on Christmas Eve, 1944. Halsey. On December 26th, a court of inquiry convened at the Uliti base aboard the Cascade destroyer. The court was presided by Vice Admiral John Hoover, and Admiral Chester Nimitz was in attendance. The officers blamed Halsey for the damage and losses that day, but ascribed no negligence, as they believed his mistakes were, quote, errors in judgment, committed under the stress of war operations, and stemming from a commendable desire to meet military requirements. The court pointed out that if Halsey had known the storm was a typhoon, he would not have moved forward with the refueling operation. In the storm's aftermath, the Pacific Fleet built new weather stations in the Caroline Islands, Manila, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. When Halsey sailed back to California, he was greeted as a national hero, with sirens, whistles, and cheering thousands. William Halsey Jr. is one of only four men who have attained the rank of Fleet Admiral of the U.S. Navy, along with Ernest King, William Leahy, and Chester Nimitz. The Admiral was also present when Japan surrendered on board his flagship, the USS Missouri, on September 2, 1945. To this day, the typhoon that took the Third Fleet by surprise is often referred to as Halsey's Storm. Thank you for watching our Dark Seas video. Please let us know in the comments below if you would like us to cover a specific wartime story at sea. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications to be informed of our newest content.